folks. Welcome to my office for this evening's service. I thought we'd do something a little different and have you here with me uh, in my office. We had somebody here visit me the other day, and they said, oh, here we are in the pastor's office. We must be in trouble. But I hope you understand this office is not a place where you always come when you're in trouble, but a place where you can come to get some troubles helped and a place for us to get remedies. So we're glad you're here with us tonight. We have several announcements I want to make for you. Trust you've had a good day. We know that we're looking forward to being back together on Wednesday evening. And we'll be the regular schedule at 7 o'clock. We have someone who's going to be able to plow the parking lot for us. So all will be well there. And we're looking forward to being back together. That'll include the children and, and Pee Wee and Pats the Pirate Clubs. It'll also uh, include uh, our Wednesday evening time together. So we'll be back together this coming Wednesday, January 26th. We'll look forward to that. Also, don't forget we have an item of business that we've been talking about for a couple of weeks now to, to have the church vote on, and that is to pay the existing balance on the mortgage on the 745 property here at the church. And that'll allow us to free up that money to apply to other debt to help us be debt-free in 23. So we're looking forward to that. The freshman class in the academy also has uh, a eat out at Tropical Smoothie this Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. So you want to stop by and maybe take your evening dinner there or your evening lunch or your afternoon lunch or whatever and be able to help the proceeds come to the, to the freshman class in the academy. February 2nd will also be uh, our beginning of our winter fall classes, our fall uh, classes on Wednesday night, our, our, our divided classes as we call them. Dr. Yoho will be uh, speaking from the book of Revelation, and I'll be preaching from Conversations with Jesus. We'll look forward to being together for those classes beginning February 2nd. So having said all that, I hope you've had a good day. We've missed you. It's not been the same. For me, every day has been Saturday for the last two weeks because I don't have Sunday in my mind ha having happened. So, But we're glad for you being here We've been here at the office. We still will be the rest of this time. Folks are getting better uh, out of their sicknesses, so we're glad for that. But I trust that you'll be back in your place this coming Wednesday evening. You know, through these times, we need to understand there is one who never changes. You know, church service schedules change. Things have to be postponed, but he never changes. And all the time, he's always right on time. And so I trust you'll listen to this great message and song about our ancient of days, the all changeable one, our great God. Listen carefully and be blessed.
Blessing to you as it was to me. I know the ancient of days, our unchangeable Lord, is a mighty fortress in whom we can hide. And I'm glad you're here, you're here with us tonight. Let's look in our Bibles now to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, beginning at verse 21. I'd like to give you tonight five eternal reminders, things that we need to be reminded of in the midst of an ever-changing society, an ever-changing historical perspective of things, that here's five things that never change. And the book of Jude was written uh, by the half-brother of our Lord that uh, wanted folks to know how to earnestly contend for the faith. The first half of the book is about identifying apostates and people who are out to really destroy the faith. And then the last part of the verse talks about us who are saved, brethren, how we ought to grow in the Lord and in our ministry. So the first eternal thing that I want you to see, or before we get there, I want you to understand, what is eternity? How can we describe eternity? There are, people have tried to describe it in different ways to try to have our finite minds get around an infinite idea of eternity. I mean, to us, 100 years is a long time, and yet very few of us attain to that. But eternity? Forever? What does that mean? How can we describe it? Here are a few things that we can uh, describe. It says, um, if, if, if the birds, if every bird on the planet would come to the east coast of the United States and pick up one grain of sand in its beak and fly all the way from the east coast all the way to the west coast and deposit that piece of sand, and then fly all the way back, and the millions of birds, millions and millions of birds would do that and take every piece of sand off the East Coast and take it to the West Coast. And then after they got all the sand taken off the West Coast and East Coast, go back to the West Coast and repeat that process and bring it all back to the East Coast. You think of the thousands and thousands and multiply millions of miles and pebbles of sand that will be, someone has suggested, that's ludicrous. That's crazy. That's impossible to even imagine. Well, that's when eternity would just begin. Someone else has said, if we took 
uh, our nation's uh, at our nation's 200th anniversary, and we would take all of the blood that was shed by our patriots that have died in all the wars that have ever been revolutionary and on French and Indian War all the way through our present time. It would fill and more than fill all of the stories of the hospitals in 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 every state. And yet. If that were a measure of eternity, eternity would just be beginning. I think of another that talked about if you take the bricks from the Empire State Building and line them up end to end across the nation, it would reach uh, from San Francisco to New, to New York. Think of the time that it would take to take down the building piece by piece and line them up end to end and then take them all back up and rebuild the building, it would still just eternity beginning. Eternity is a hard concept for us to put our mind around. But God says there are certain things that are eternal because of his nature. He is eternal. He never changes. He's always the same. That eternal God is the God that loves you and me, Tabernacle. He's the God that cares about the widow who is most lonely, raising those children, uh, or missing her husband, or the single mom, or the single lady, whatever is going on, that God is able to minister with eternal things in the life of temporary woes and heartaches. I want you to see these five eternal things that we find in the book of Jude. After telling them to contend for the faith and now grow up in their most holy faith, he begins uh, saying in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The idea of that word uh, keeping there is the, is, is the idea is to hold on to. It's the idea of to not let it go away, to hold on to, it says in the scripture there, the love of God, how God cares, how God uh, be looking for the mercy that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ unto what kind of life? Eternal life. We ought to be holding on to those things that matter most. And then he describes what eternal love that God sends our way and eternal life that God sends our way. What's going to happen is that that will fruit itself out in an eternal mission. And that eternal mission is this. And of some... Have compassion, making a difference. You take the love of God, shed it abroad in our hearts, and you shed it abroad to others' hearts, and you make a difference in their life. But then verse 22, verse 23 says, and others, that's others of a different kind, you save or see converted with fear, pulling them out of the fire, even hating the garment spotted by the flesh. There are times when hell, fire, and brimstone needs to be shared in truth and judgment needs to be given to people to show them without Christ they're lost. But in this passage of scripture, that is a mission of an eternal nature that you and I have. An eternal mission because God loved us, because he gave us eternal life. We need to be sure to take the gospel with compassion and with fire if necessary to others. May God help us to understand the eternality of that mission. Now, here's the thought. We had just a few years to send missionaries, to give to missions, to pray that God would send some of our own children to the mission field, to pray that God would do the work of letting us be a witness to others around us, to present truth in our place, like I mentioned this morning. If we do that, we will be sowing for eternity rewards that'll matter for eternity and not that that'll just be consumed like wood, hay, and stubble. I urge you, invest yourself in the eternal mission. Why? Because of four more eternal things about our God. It says in verse 24, And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. We note these are salutations. These are closings. These 
are things that we that that the writers of the New Testament close their epistles, their 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 letters to the different individuals and churches. But they are as inspired as all the other parts of Scripture. And I want you to see that 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 in that in Jude closing this passage of Scripture, first of all speaks to another eternal matter, and I believe it's the eternal the eternal matter of eternal security. Now unto him, not us, but unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Here's the truth when it comes to the matter of eternal security. There are those that argue, well, that gives people a, a, a license to sin because once saved, always saved. And so they can live their life like they want to and they're trusting that God is going to take them to heaven anyway. Let me, let me be careful and, and, and be very pointed in this. People who love God don't live in their sin without conviction. If they go about and said, I prayed a prayer in a church one time and I was, I was uh, saved and now I live a life that is licentious and wicked and it doesn't bother me, dear friend, they're not saved. If they were saved, the Holy Spirit would smite their heart every time they would do something or say something wicked and wrong. If you have that kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, when we get angry at somebody unbiblically and we speak badly to them and we say that's wrong and the Spirit convicts us and we go back and make it right, that's because it's not that we are without sin, but it's that when we do sin, we are convicted about it and we respond to God and his conviction to clean our hearts with him and others. But a person that is saved is not kept saved by how much we do to make God receive us. The Bible is very clear here. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling. God is the one that's able to keep us saved. The scripture tells us in other passages that we are kept in our salvation by the power of God. Others who speak of, well, you can lose your salvation. When you start living wrongly, you lose it and you got to get saved again. That's a reflection on the ability and power of God. Because it's not us who keep ourselves saved. It is God who keeps us saved. So we have that wonderful blessing of knowing that we are eternally secure because of God's might. And as we are disobedient Christians, as I mentioned earlier, God chastens us as he chastens, as a father on this earth chastens his son. So we thank God for that eternal mission he's given us, but we thank God for the eternal security that we have in Christ. He's able to have no man pluck us out of his father's hand. Does it give us a license to sin? But it ought to create a love and respect for God as our Heavenly Father. That when He chastens us, we respond. Third thing I want you to see that's of an eternal nature is the Bible speaks of eternal, uh, eternal intercession in this passage. Now unto Him that's able to keep you from falling in verse 24 and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. God is able through what Jesus did for us covering our sin, giving us access to the Father through him. Romans 5.1 speaks to that. That we can pre be presented to God with joy because of what Jesus is doing to intercede for us. We have one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. He is, he, he is going to present us faultless. His blood covers our sin. When God looks at us from heaven through the blood of Christ, it's as if we've never sinned. The most beautiful illustration of that is found in the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant. Above that Ark of the Covenant was the, was the cherubim that was over the Ark and the mercy seat beneath them. The contents of the Ark were three things. Aaron's rod that budded, that spoke of people's rebellion. The manna that speaks of God's provision because they were not to provide for themselves. The Ten Commandments were another, a third part of the contents of that ark that showed the exceeding sinfulness of man. So all the contents of the ark showed God, our rebellion, our sinfulness, our necessity to depend upon God. And that speaks of, our, of everything that we are sinful and lacking and we need God. But that contents of the ark was covered by the mercy seat which is a picture of Jesus Christ. And God's presence that dwelt between the winged creatures, the cherubims, over the ark. When God looks at the contents of the ark, 
our rebellion, our exceeding needs, our, our, our sinfulness. It's covered by the mercy seat. Jesus is the intercessory mediator between God and man for us. What an eternal reminder that we don't deserve heaven, but Jesus gave it to us because of his, of his intercessory work. Beautiful it is to know that everything you're going through in life, you have an interceder to go to, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, you may have a heavy burden on your heart or some strain that's going on in your life or maybe an upcoming surgery or a problem. Just remember, you have an, an eternal interceder, a mediator, and that's the Lord Jesus who wants to help in your life. Well, we have an eternal mission because of God showing his love and giving us eternal life. We have the eternal security. We have found it in the power of God and in Christ. We have eternal intercession that's being offered for us. Thirdly, I want you to see, it says, verse 25, to the only wise God, our Savior. Afforded to us is eternal wisdom. Eternal wisdom. Somebody has defined wisdom as the as the proper application of godly facts. You can know a fact about something, that God is this and God is that, but what wisdom tells you, what does that mean to me? When, when God tells us to, uh, to love our enemies, how does that flesh out? It takes wisdom to learn how to love that person that really irritates you. It's God's wisdom that helps you work through a situation that's very uncomfortable. You take the facts of God's truth and you apply it to wisdom. But our God is eternal wisdom. There is nothing on this earth that pertains to life and godliness, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, that we don't have an answer for an exceeding great and precious promises in the Bible that can give us answer to them, answers to them. This is God's eternal wisdom. You got a problem tonight? Look to God's eternal wisdom. You got trouble brewing? Look to God's eternal wisdom. You're trying to figure out what's going on? Look to God's eternal wisdom. God can help us because of these eternal things that he gives to us and has revealed to us in his word where we can find the wisdom of God. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How do we find out who the Lord is and how to fear him or have reverence for him? It's in the Bible. So be in the word, finding that wisdom that God wants for us. And then finally tonight, not only is there eternal an eternal mission, not only is there uh, the wonderful fact of eternal security, uh, eternal intercession, eternal, uh, if you will, uh, God's, uh, God's eternal uh, wisdom to us. But finally, it says, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. There is eternal glory. We need to get used to glorifying, putting great worth and worship upon who God is. I think the emphasis we recently put on thinking about the words in a congregational song when you sing them is very important because we're putting worth on who God is. When I think of great hymns like, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all the earth proclaims thy name, all those things that we sing, it's because God deserves our, his glory. The heavens declare his glory. Men's lips ought to declare his glory. Our actions should glorify him. And whatever we do or eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the what? The glory of God. That Giving God glory will, will be part of and is, should be part of our living now to glorify God in all that he does. We are so negligent sometimes when he answers prayer to not glorify him for it. When he heals us from our sicknesses to not thank him for it. To give him honor and glory is above everything that we should do when you think about who he is and what he's done for us. I want to encourage you as you begin a new week, remember you serve an eternal, wonderful, powerful God. He's given us an eternal mission and equipped us with the blessings of eternal security and eternal wisdom. 
being able to give him eternal glory with the eternal intercession of, of, of the Lord Jesus. What more could we need to live a life that can honor him? Well, there were years and years of playing sports when I was a kid. And I thought, you know, I need to be able to play well enough to make an all-star team. And I remember when I was 12 years old, I made the all-star team. I was able to be the starting catcher for the Olive Branch Little League and our playing against other teams in the area and in the state of Virginia. And I remember my dad taught us a great lesson. He said, we're going to keep the Lord first. We're, we're saved. I'm going to school. We're going to, you're going to become a, a preacher. We need to honor God. And for me, the, co the, co the coach called a, a practice on Sunday. And I talked to dad about it. He said, son, well, it's only going to be one or two weeks. We're not going to make it our habit. You've got to practice. And so I went to practice that Sunday. While I was catching behind the plate, a foul ball came off and came and hit my glove a certain way and jammed my thumb into my palm, caused it to be tender and swelling. And uh, I, I, I was left on the team, but I couldn't squeeze a bat. I couldn't catch pitches because it hit against that soreness in my palm. And in the end, I had to be cut from the team and somebody else come and take my place. Now, that's hard for a 12-year-old to say, I was the best in my league at catching, and somebody took my place. But I want you to know, when you put God in the right place, nobody ever takes his place. He is never second. He's always first. That's the God you and I serve. And I'm so glad we have him. Now, we've missed you. We're looking forward to being back together on Wednesday. God bless you. We'll see you then. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless these folks that have listened tonight, those that will listen later. I pray that you'd make this, these five eternal reminders a blessing to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Good night.